All right, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be speaking at my first uh, B-Size Las Vegas. It's great to get a chance to, to talk to you all today. I'm gonna talk about something called proprietary protocols. It's something I think we leverage not enough in the industry, both from an offensive and defensive perspective. So I'm gonna go through uh, both of those things. Uh, first off, uh, I like to say, who's the crazy guy talking in front of you? Uh, I've been in the industry for about 15 years almost, which is scary to say out loud. Uh, mostly on the offensive side of the house, doing uh, a lot of uh, hacking. I'm also the author and lead instructor for SAN Security 568, which is a product security pen testing class. Uh, and during the day, I'm the executive director for uh, threat research at SonicWall. So spend a lot of time in security, threat intelligence, and networking stuff, which is what's important for today's talk. You can look me up on almost any social media platform at Full Metal Packets. Happy to discuss anything cybersecurity related if you are interested. So to set the stage a little bit, uh, I'm a little guilty, right? Being a SANS instructor, I always end up defining everything before, uh, before I get started. So we, we need to start by talking about what do I mean when I say proprietary protocols? So an open protocol are things that you're very well familiar with from a networking perspective. These are things like HTTP, FTP. These are protocols that have what's called an RFC. So these protocols, you, if you wanna know how they work, you can go somewhere, you can look up that RFC, it'll put you to sleep, but that's okay. It'll still tell you exactly how the protocol functions. On the other side, we have proprietary protocols. And this is the opposite. These are protocols that have been created by vendors, typically for a very specific purpose. Now I did some Googling online looking at like what do people think about proprietary protocols and I found this graphic posted online. And I, I love this because it illustrates the point that the internet always knows everything that it's talking about, right? So here, it's, the vendor is marketing that proprietary protocols, what's so good about them is they are safer because they are unknown. Now I've, I've only been in the industry a short time but security through obscurity I don't think is the mantra that typically pays out from a security perspective. So this is not accurate, right? It's actually, we wanna take the time to understand these protocols because they're beneficial whether or not you're on the red side of the house or the blue side of the house. So I've put together what I call an eight step process for dissecting and understanding proprietary protocols. I cover this in Security 568 in about a day and a half, which I do not have time obviously for uh, here today. So we're gonna talk about four of the eight steps. And I'm doing this because I believe if you wanna walk out of here today and apply this immediately, these four steps will get you started on the road to immediately apply these principles and start helping you uh, within, within the workplace. So to jump right in, I'm gonna talk about the first concept here referred to as simplifying scope. So what do I mean by simplifying scope? To put it simply, it's the concept of reducing data down to a reasonable size. So taking a large quantity, in this case of packets, sometimes we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of packets, and how do we get less data? That's the goal of simplifying scope, because I don't know about you, but I do not have a time to look at 1,000 packets, 10,000 packets, or 100,000 packets in my daily workflow. So how do we do it? Now the key to this is, we can't just randomly select what packets we look at. In selecting less data, we have to do it in a statistical significant manner. And what that means is we wanna select a representation of the entire data set. Keyword there being representation. We don't want to select the entire data set and it has to be statistically relevant. So simplifying scope is selecting that data set in a statistically relevant way. And the way I start thinking about this is starting through what I call grouping packets. And we're gonna group packets to find out what type of types or likeness we have between packets. The goal here is to be able to pick a packet from each type or likeness to have a representation of that group. So one way to get started here, these are five different methods to start grouping your packets. By no means is it an exhaustive list. I'm sure you can find other ways to do this as well. But starting with the first one, protocols themselves or higher level protocols. Almost every proprietary protocol rides on top of another protocol. And it's not uncommon to see multiple higher, or I, actually I'm saying that in reverse, lower level protocols, multiple lower level protocols being used within a proprietary protocol. So you might have TCP and UDP being leveraged by a proprietary protocol. 
simply splitting them out into two different types or groups of packets starts to get you two different representations of those protocols. Another way to do this is by conversations or flows. Many of you are probably familiar with, in Wireshark, you can uh, right click and do, you know, show me the TCP flow or UDP flow. At times, what we see is that a flow of traffic is one format or one type of protocol. Again, what we're trying to do is to group these so that we have likeness between our groups so we can analyze one or a couple of packets in that group and have an understanding of that larger group. Another way to do this is by port numbers. Oftentimes, especially destination port numbers, will ingest or parse a different type or format of packet. Think about this from an operating system perspective. What is a thread, right? Port numbers are often tied to threads. They're, they're independent sections of code. Well, that code is different oftentimes between threads. They're parsing different, different types of packets. We can also use payload length. This often surprises a lot of people. But generally speaking, and again, this is not all the time, right? Not 100% of the time. But generally speaking, packets of the same length often have the same format or the same function. And so using length as a tool can be very useful. And lastly, let's not forget about basic computer science tools for things like integrity. If the MD5 is the same between two packets, they're the same payload, right? The same packet. And we can leverage that to our advantage. So using these five methods, the best way to communicate this is to do this in real time. So I'm going to walk through leveraging this concept of simplifying scope using a real proprietary protocol here in this presentation. So here on the screen is a proprietary protocol. Wireshark clearly knows not, not what to do with it. This is obviously just a screenshot of a much larger PCAP. And we want to start reducing this scope of this PCAP. So to give you the larger context, in this PCAP, there's about 516 packets captured in about 188 seconds or about three minutes. That's a lot of packets, right? No, no, not really. That's kind of a trick question. That's actually like nothing. Three minutes of a network capture can be like 200,000 packets, right? So I say that to illustrate that we're going to do this for just 500 packets, uh, but you're likely going to be working with a lot more, but the, point, the principles will hold. So one of the things we can leverage, they talked about ground truth being potentially a data science -y track, is this concept of EDA. EDA is exploratory data analysis. We can actually use code to make it, so we have to, what uh, my co-author for 568, Ishmael, likes to say is not, we don't have to read the matrix. He accuses me of reading the matrix by just looking at packets. We can leverage code. So here is a pandas, or here's, I'm sorry, here's Python code, which is leveraging Scapy to put packets into a panda data frame. By putting packets into a panda data frame, we can start doing statistical analysis on these packets. And we can use the grouping mechanisms that I talked about on the previous slide in code a lot faster. And we don't have to actually be able to recognize this visually. So here in four lines of code, I argue it's really two lines of code because two of the lines of code are print statements. We can ingest a PCAP and display uh, the different protocols, known protocols in that packet. So here we've got UDP and TCP. Now, if we do this for the example PCAP that I provided you, or provided on the screen, for the grouping principle, here are four of the different grouping techniques I talk about. The first one was I said you can group by a lower level protocol. Well, unfortunately, here that becomes useless, right? The entire PCAP is UDP, so we're going to have to try again. So we're going to look at another method. I said destination ports could be something that is useful for grouping. If we le you leverage our pandas data frame to graph out destination ports, we instantly get four distinct groups of packets. OK, now we're on to something. There's a chance that these are all of similar format or different formats, if you will. What if we use length? Well, if we use length, we also get four distinct different groups, which begs the question, is there an overlap between length and destination ports? We always, when we're simplifying scope, the stronger case we can make is the more data points we can use. And it just so happens that if we tell Python to group these together, we actually get a perfect marrying of length and destination port. And this is very simple to do, leveraging EDA and leveraging pandas. You don't have to always visually see this. You can totally do this, what I would call the hard way, and I've done it that way many times. But this is, will speed up your process. So now we have this concept of 
okay, if we take the length and the destination port number, this could help reduce our data set. But we've looked at one PCAP. Is that statistically relevant? No, right? One PCAP of data of one capture, that's great, but this could just be a random trend that we found. And that's very important in dissecting proprietary protocols. You need multiple captures, multiple instances of the same behavior, and that's also very key. So let's go ahead and look at this again for a second take of the same behavior of the protocol we're looking at. And what happens is we actually get a very similar representation. There's a few minor differences here, but the important thing to point out is that our length by destination port number pairing still holds true. And we can test this a couple more times, but the concept is this is likely a good place to start to reduce our scope down to four packet types. So here we had 516 packets in 188 seconds, and in just a few minutes, we selected four that require analysis, not 516. And I can't stress enough that out of all of the eight steps in the process I have put together for reversing proprietary protocols, this sets you up for either success or failure. This is probably the most important step. So now moving on to some of the other steps. The other thing that I will note uh, here quickly is the first step has to be first. You have to do simplify scope. The rest of this is kind of in an order that I felt was useful to me and to my workflow and can definitely be rearranged to your workflow. Once you've done simplified scope, you can rearrange these to whatever you feel is the most useful. So I'm going to talk about a concept called embedded networking as the next scope. It's, it's actually uh, very common in proprietary protocols to see embedded networking within the payload of the protocol that matches the networking da data in the other lower layers. So what do I mean by that? Things like IP addresses, MAC addresses, port numbers are often duplicated in the application layer or payload layer of the packet. The number one question I get when I talk about this information is why? To be honest, I don't have a definitive answer to that question. I've never written a proprietary protocol. My hypothesis, which I think is, is based on a decent amount of data, is there's a chance there's a large chance that the higher level application that's receiving this information does not have access to the networking layer of information. So if they want to make a decision based on, let's say, an IP address of where something coming from or a port number, they embed that in, that, uh, in the payload so they can access that information. I think is typically why we see this, but th this is seen all over the place. So here we have Wireshark in the IP layer it's showing us that the source address is 126.1.1.1. I love this cheat. If you highlight it in Wireshark, it highlights it in the payload in hexadecimal for you. It makes it very easy to visually notice that there's another value of the exact same pattern in the payload of the packet. And this is the concept of embedded networking. If we take this concept and we look at all four of the packets, the representation that we took from the larger groups, we'll actually notice that three out of the four have a IP address embedded in the payload of the packet. So now we're well on our way to understanding how this protocol works. Our goal here ultimately is to go from knowing nothing to knowing something. It's sometimes we're able to find out what every byte means. Sometimes it's not possible or not easy to do, but we get one step closer to understanding that protocol. The next uh, concept or step, if you will, is something I call enumerating patterns. And this is the idea of leveraging patterns across packets, across PCAPs, and within the context of a capture, and I'll show you what I mean by that here in a moment, and to, to determine what bytes in a payload may represent. So let's first zoom out and look at the higher level PCAP again, uh, just from a Wireshark perspective. Now here we're filtering by length and port number because that was what we concluded was one group of packet. So now we're looking at the group that we've decided and we're saying, what are some patterns within this group? And it doesn't have to only be within the payload. I see that as a common mistake. Immediately you open up the hex decimal view and I want to look at the payload. Well, how about looking at the overall conversation? One thing that sticks out as a pattern, if you will, is this repetitiveness of four packets in a row from the client, four packets in a row from the server. Okay, that's interesting. And we can also see from a time perspective, these packets are sent almost at the exact same moment in time. Well, because 
uh, we have this data in a pandas data frame, it's very easy to check other grouping methods that I talked about in the beginning. With just one line of code, we can actually check the MD5 hash of these packets. Are they the same, or are we dealing with different packets? And what we find out is that four packets is actually the same packet repeated. So what we care about are what are the differences between the repeated packet and the packet that has changed. Understanding how uh, cryptography works, this could be one byte. This could be the entire packet that's different. So we want to start tackling this question, what is different and what can we learn about the fact that there's a difference here? So here if we open up the three, three of the packets for the, to see the difference across the different payloads, and we simply, no, nothing fancy or, or trickery here, we start looking at one byte at a time after where we have known data. So we know the IP address, we know where it is in all three of these packets, we see that it's the same, that's expected because it's coming from the same place. What is the next byte? Well, it turns out we start looking byte by byte and the next three bytes are the same. Where we get a difference is the fourth byte. Interesting. So three packets in a row, the first thing that is different is there's four bytes, three bytes are the same, one that is different. Now in networking, it's, it's possible to have one byte that indicates something. That's why Scapy has a byte field, for example. However, it's more common to see two or four bytes or more increments. So you're, it, dissecting packets is a little bit of an art. You have to make some assumptions and then either prove or disprove those assumptions. Most of the time, I'm going to not assume that one byte is different on its own. I'm going to assume there's a group of bytes involved. And here, since I have one byte changing, I'm going to look at these as a four byte group and see if I can determine what these look like. Now, if you can spot it using the hexadecimal here, there is a difference of 10 between each one of these. I apologize for mixing decimal math and hexadecimal, but I think it illustrates the point a little bit more simply on, on the slide. So here we see it incrementing by 10. So what could that mean? That could mean a lot of things. One, it could in theory be a coincidence, even though I don't believe in most coincidences. What is causing this to change? If we zoom out again and we look at the, the, the entire PCAP or filtered PCAP and we look at those four packets, we can see that there's something else changing by 10 and it's the value of time. So almost exactly to time, there is a 10 second difference between each one of these packets. Does that mean that this value represents time? Not, it could, but it also could not be. I, I just randomly started the next four bytes and found a 10 difference. So how do we validate this hypothesis? Well, we can take those four bytes and we can convert them using an epoch converter. Why epoch? Because that's the most likely thing you're going to see in, uh, in hexadecimal in a packet and we get a timestamp of Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018. Does that mean it's a timestamp? Well, it could just randomly translate into a, a time. We want to validate this by looking at the frame of the packet. The frame of the packet also shows January 23rd, 2018. The time itself is slightly different, but the, the probability of the date being exactly the same across those two values is pretty low. It's a pretty strong indicator that this is likely a time value in the packet. So that's just one way that you can leverage, one thing you can determine by looking at patterns across payloads and across different, uh, across a PCAP. I'm gonna jump down here for a second to step seven, and I'm gonna talk about application reverse engineering. Uh, this is something that is very useful to you for dissecting proprietary protocols if it is an option, and I stress the if part, because a lot of times we're dealing with proprietary protocols in IoT, IOM, ICS infrastructure, and you may not always have access to the application to do the reverse engineering. But if you do have the access, the, if an application is sending and receiving a protocol, it understands it. If it understands it, you have the source code, and you have to just be able to read that source code. So this is a very strong tool in your tool belt if it's applicable. If we go back to our PCAP, uh, this uh, a little bit about this protocol. This is a medical protocol. Uh, it's called the RWhat protocol. And here, what we were looking at was the client. The client, in this case, is a medical device. Not impossible to get the parsing code, for sure. We could do some hardware hacking techniques. We could pull off firmware. Uh, we could see if it was downloadable, but definitely the more difficult approach. The server, in this instance, is a Windows machine. 
much more friendly to work at if we want to do some application reverse engineering. So for a moment, if we say that we didn't figure out what that time value was, and we wanted to investigate if the server side had some clues of what that was, we could dump the server, uh, in this case DLL, into something like IDA Pro. And right off the bat, in IDA Pro, this is right in the very beginning of the code, uh, we get some clues to what, be going, what might be going on here. Now, lucky in this case, a lot of debugging symbols were left in, function names were left in, uh, the majority of this was left here for, for me to view, uh, which is extremely helpful, right, in determining this. I recognize that it might not always be the case uh, dur during your event, but it's something to look out for. So here we have a function called broadcast rwood. I did not rename that. That was provided to me by the developers. Thank you very much. We know from a little bit of uh, OSN, rwood's the name of our protocol. Broadcast, it's going to the broadcast address. This makes sense. I'm looking in the right place, right? We go down and we see that there is another function called get rwhat period. It's being saved into a variable. I did rename the variable. So the variable name is rwhat period. I named that uh, for just for readability on, on the slide, but I did not name the function. And we can see that that variable is being used in a debug statement. I love logging and debug statements. They provide a lot of useful information, especially for something like this. And it says the rwhat period is so many seconds. And if we dig into that function just a little bit further, we can see that there is a value that's being returned either 10, 15, or 20, uh, depending on what a configuration is. I also named this variable as well. So this one was not left in, but I renamed it for, for readability. So this is just an example, again, of using the tools in your tool belt to help determine what is going on the wire, uh, what's going on on the wire, or the ground truth, if, if you will. So I'm going to take a break of go from going into the different processes of reverse engineering those protocols, that gives you kind of a, a quick ramp up. As I said, I do this for a day and a half in, in Security 568. Uh, but I'm gonna turn to talk a little bit about how you can leverage this from an offensive and a defensive perspective. So starting with the offensive side, I'm biased. I did mostly offensive security, so I, I generally start there. I wanna go over three principles really quick that you can leverage proprietary protocols for, assuming you understand just at least a little bit about them. And so. I'm gonna talk about exfiltration, emul uh, emulation, excuse me, and falsification. So starting with exfiltration. If you remember, there was four packet types we looked at, we grouped by length and port number. This is the longest packet on the screen of the ones uh, that we selected. A concept that I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have time to discuss today is the concept of padding. Proprietary protocols generally leverage a lot of different padding. And they can do this in one common way is to do it in the form of null bytes. Not always, it can be any value, but oftentimes it's either in null bytes or F, or what I see the most commonly used. Here I've highlighted on the screen all the null bytes within the larger packet. You can see there's quite a large quantity of them. In fact, additionally, if we zoom into the top part, we can actually see there's even runs of 32, 38 bytes of consistent null bytes. If you think command and control, if you think exfiltration of data, and you know that these are going to a broadcast address, it's very simple to embed what you might need from an attacker's perspective hidden within these padding bytes to leverage on the network. And frankly, and the reality of it is, most defenders have no idea what this protocol is. It's not being parsed by IDSs or other security tools, unless they're doing this, you likely don't even have to get the format right. You can probably strip out the rest of the payload and, and put the whole 600 bytes with whatever you want. Maybe have a few values in the beginning correct so that way it looks like the other stuff, but it's very easy to exfiltrate data with proprietary protocols. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is emulation. Oftentimes from an offensive perspective, it's useful to make it look like a device is there that's not there, or that you took down and you wanted to keep looking like it was doing what it was supposed to do. I'm gonna use the RWAT, the medical example, to, to demonstrate this in a, a, a quick little video here. Don't get caught up on the medical nature of this. So this is the server, uh, and I'm plugging in a Raspberry Pi, obviously not a medical device, right? This is just a Raspberry Pi. And the server is gonna interpret the data that the Raspberry Pi is sending as valid medical data. It's actually gonna report it as a heartbeat. And so as long as this Raspberry Pi is plugged in, it's gonna keep getting that emulated data from the proprietary protocol. 
Now don't get hung up on, again, the medical example here. You could use this in a large number of different use cases where you could uh, pretend that something's working at a certain level that it's not. And very closely aligned to that is the idea of maybe I don't want to emulate the entire device, but I want to falsify the information that the device is sending. So again, leveraging this medical example, uh, here we have the end medical device. This is a patient monitor, and it's showing that 80 beats per minute is what's being translated. And we're going to bring that up in the uh, central monitoring system here, or the server side of the device. And you're going to see that data communicated across. Now, an attacker that understands how this protocol is supposed to work can manipulate that protocol as it goes over the wire. Already demonstrated, Python's very good at and using Scapy, uh, at bringing in these packets and, and utilizing them. We can, in a simple script here, we can send, we can intake those packets, we can send them back out, and we can have them with a completely different value, in this case, jumping to 180. Now again, don't get hung up on the medical nature of this example. Obviously, there's implications from a medical perspective, but think about this, what about an alarm system? Whether you wanted an alarm to go off or not go off, right? Think about any type of ICS system, whether you wanted to, to make sure that a, a valve was open or a valve was closed, all of this applies to that as well. So that's from the offensive perspective. So now let's talk, take a little bit about the defensive perspective of proprietary protocols. Even though I come from a background that's largely offensive, I actually think from a proprietary protocol perspective, this is way more important. We have to understand the data on our networks in order to be able to defend it properly. We have to have that baseline of information. And reversing these protocols helps provide us that baseline. So I'm going to talk about three different uh, concepts again from a defensive perspective. I'm going to talk about threat modeling, mitigations, and detection. And because it's 2024 and I'm speaking at a conference, I have to leverage AI or they literally cart me out of the room. So, I am going to make sure that I get some of it in this presentation. There is a model out there called Stride GPT. I don't know if anybody's heard this before, but it's, it's used for threat modeling and it can produce mitigations. It's actually a really neat tool. Like most AI powered functions, it, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Do I think it should replace your threat modeling and mitigation strategy? Absolutely not. But it is a great place to get started to give you some ideas on how to move forward from a defensive perspective. One of the things that uh, I, we talk a lot about threat modeling in uh, Security 568, and one of the things we talk about is the threat modeling manifesto, which has four questions for threat modeling. Two of them are, what are we working on and what can go wrong? And we document them doing something called a DFD, or data flow diagram. So what you see here on the screen is a data flow diagram of a different protocol. This is not the medical one that I was talking about before that, is, that has been produced by reverse engineering this protocol and understanding how a system works, and as a result, what could go wrong with it. This is created in draw.io. What's really cool is we can upload this image to Stride GPT, and Stride GPT is able to then understand a little bit about how the system works. It actually populates this description field that you see on the bottom automatically based on that diagram. I fill out a few other questions on the right-hand side about the application. In this case, it's an IoT application. It has basic authentication. You hit this Generate Threat Model button at the bottom, and you're off with a, uh, a generated threat model to start your work with. It does different things on top of generating, because the threat model it's going to generate, I'm sorry, is stride-based, hence the stride GPT. Stride's not always the most useful methodology to use. One of the things that I like to leverage is something called attack trees. And this will actually generate an attack tree for you and provide it to you in a graph form. I find this extremely useful when thinking about things like mitigations and what can go wrong within your network. If we look at the nodes all the way at the bottom, we can see these are the outcomes or the potential malicious activities or the risks that can occur by using this protocol. Of course, this is based on what the AI, the AI thinks generated on the, in, the, the input that you gave it. But I think it's more actually impactful than the, act, the outcomes at the end are the fact that you can see what I like to call these choke points within the attack tree. You can see that there's this one thing that's leading to multiple potential risky outcomes. So if I'm able to mitigate this one thing, I get the biggest bang for my buck as protecting against these, these type of attacks. 
Here, obviously, in this particular instance, the fact that it's an unencrypted TCP protocol is providing the way, or paving the way for four of the outcomes provided. The other thing you can do with an attack tree is you can look for things that your organization may be specifically concerned about. Uh, a lot of times in the government world, location leakage is an important thing. And here, the threat model has identified that a location leakage can occur. Well, I can work backwards now. So I don't really care about the other potential outcomes, but I care about this one. I can work backwards up the tree and say, what do I have to do to mitigate the risk of location leakage? If you're paying attention, you can also see on this slide a little bit of the imperfections or not usefulness of something like Stride, GP, or Stride GPT. Excuse me. In fact, having a node that says UDP network traffic risks is not very helpful, right? But again, this is a, a model. It's a representation. Uh, as George Box used to say, all models are wrong. Some are useful. What we're striving for here is something that is useful to help you mitigate risk in your organization, not for something that is 100% correct. Taking this one step further, uh, Stride GPT will also provide you a mitigation suggestions based on the attack trees and threat model it provides. Sometimes these are not super useful, they're super overarching or industry best practice, but again, they can jog the thought process on what are things I can try to implement. I like this first one here that it produces. Of course, it's going to align these with stride again. That's why you see spoofing here and tampering. And obviously, the screen is cut short. Uh, so it, it, that may or may not fit your methodology. But the first one, remember we talked about emulation on the offensive side. This first one's actually very well geared to emulation. It, it gives you a scenario, and it gives you a potential suggested mitigation. The first scenario is an attacker uses a forged IP address to impersonate a legitimate client. That sounds like emulation. That's what we talked about in the offensive section. So what is something we can implement to help prevent that? Here it suggests implementing IP whitelisting. That's a good suggestion. That would definitely help with that emulation problem that we're seeing on from an offensive side. So lastly, uh, I want to talk about uh, detection, uh, which is also something that can be uh, extremely important from a defensive perspective. I'm going to do so uh, in utilizing Zeek. I think Zeek is probably one of the most well-known open source IDS tools out there, so I'd like to use stuff that people are likely familiar with. One of the things that I was short in having time to talk about is the, this concept of documentation by SCAPI. It's probably the second most important principle in dissecting pro proprietary protocols and is that you have to document your findings. And nobody likes documentation. I highly suggest that findings are documented using code. So as you learn about your protocol, if you write what's called a custom scapey layer that is reusable then for both defensive and offensive purposes. Offensive things like fuzzing, for example. Defensive, we can use it for detection or logging or baselining. So here would be an output from the, uh, the second protocol I showed you of a scapey layer for that UDP packet. And this is just writing a scapey layer for, uh, for what we've learned doing the, the reversing. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there are probably people in the room that are way more familiar with Zeek than myself, so uh, happy to talk if I'm incorrect about this, but I don't believe Zeek understands scapey directly. You've got to do something else in order to get it there. Well, one of the things that it does understand is a language called SPICY. And it's actually very simple to take a SCAPI protocol and to convert it to a SCAPI, uh, I'm sorry, a SPICY syntax. I kind of like the way that phrase, is, uh, phrase works out. And so here what I've done is I've taken the SCAPI protocol and I've implemented in uh, SPICY uh, syntax. Now this is something that you can compile that Zeek understands how to use. So we can compile this using the Spiky C compiler that comes with Zeek, and we can now create a Zeek event. This is very, very basic. I'm just simply showing that you can print out information about the proprietary protocol uh, to the screen. Show you what that might look like. You can run the custom proto or the proprietary protocol through, uh, through Zeek directly, and you can see that it's parsing out the embedded networking. Here we have something called a type field and a session ID that's in the protocol, but there's that location data. This protocol is actually sending you coordinates every time a UDP packet goes out on the location the UDP packet came from. Here it's repeated five times in this payload, and you can see that it's now understood by Zeek. What can you do with this? 
You can now detect anomalies, right? You can now print this to log files that you're ingesting in all your other security tool sets to write rules around. You can't do that if you don't take the time to understand the proprietary uh, protocol. So I think there's a, a lot of value in this. So that's what I've got for you today. I thank you for taking the time to, to listen to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. If we have time left, I don't know exactly where we are on the schedule. Uh, happy, to, happy to take any questions live or afterwards. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think they have a mic they want you to use. I'm... Hello. Hello. Great talk. Thanks. Um, do you know of or can there exist a scapey to spicy to Wireshark to sector pipeline? I don't know of a <laughs> pipeline that exists. I, I do or think, some variation there. Yeah, just, I'm not aware of one that currently exists. Right. I think it would be a great thing if you want to start open source. We'll go and venture. Thank you. That would be fantastic, but I, I'm, unaware of, I'm not aware of one. A, a, any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, when you're working with these uh, proprietary protocols and you find issues that are um, abusable from an offensive security standpoint, do you work with the vendors on those? Like, what's your process there, Steph? Uh, absolutely. I've, I've found, well, in fact, I've got several CVEs to my name just to that specific point is issues with that. And yeah, uh, follow responsible disclosure is, is typically the way I go about it, as if a vulnerability discover, discovery process. Uh, there, it does get very complex depending on the industry in which the proprietary protocol is being used. Uh, in in uh, one that I discovered that was in the um, building automation industry, for example, that was a relatively easy fix. That fix was in, in software on the firmware that was digesting the protocol, and they were able to push an update to that. Uh, and so that was a very good process. And another instance where we found flaws in the protocol that was in the medical industry, right, that gets a lot more complicated, right? They, uh, they had said that they'd have to go through their accreditations all over again to make that change, right? And then you have, and that's the constant problem you have in ICS, IoT, critical infrastructure is it's not as easy as patch it, right? Uh, but yes, to, to answer your question directly, when I've discovered flaws in the protocol before, work directly with the vendor to responsibly disclose them and then do some type of coordinated release. Uh, have you done anything with identifying hashes or signatures in packet streams? I'm sorry, say that again, hashes or signatures where? Hashes or signatures in the packet stream. Yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of times a characteristic I see a lot of is different CRCs, for example, which are not, I know they're not a hash, but the same, same concept that, that you're talking about. Uh, those are obviously get a little bit more complex to identify one thing that uh, there often times, if you're looking at cryptographic tokens of some type, a lot of times they're at the end of a packet. And my, my advice for when you run into that is, you don't wanna try to look for those first, right? You wanna weed out like the other steps that I'm showing, uh, embedded networking, clear text communication, uh, you're running tool, like external tools like Binwalk and things like that on payloads to help you identify. What you're gonna end up with is you're gonna get all that stuff taken care of and now there's gonna be a group of five bytes over here that you have no idea what it is. You're gonna find two bytes over here that you have no idea what it is, right? You can start looking at those then with a cryptographic mindset uh, to say, is this potentially a hash? Is this potentially some type of CRC? Uh, a lot of times you wanna use the, I think it's step six in the process is behavior modification. Uh, and the concept with behavior modification is you wanna set up the protocol to work in a normal environment, intercept that traffic, make a change, and then see how that change affects the client and the server. If you're messing with a hash or a CRC, you will immediately see something not work the way it's supposed to. And that's a very good way to identify that. Again, I talk about that more in depth uh, in, in the longer program. But next question. Did that answer your question, sir? Oh yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, just a thought I had when you were talking about this, especially like for the you know for these medical device things. Um, you know, the first thought in my mind from a defensive standpoint, it'd be really helpful if they provided you, if they provided like the, uh, if they were able to provide um, these templates for the, for these proprietary messages. And, and my argument would be, you know, you go, you have to go, of course they would have to consider this during development, but you could convince them that this is a good idea because then this will make it 
easier for the the people trying to defend the hospital networks against rogue and you know against attack um has has there been any thought or has this been like discussed within at least with within yeah, the I, industry I, I think it's a it's a very well known uh problem slash solution space i i think uh, and if you look now, especially in the medical industry, you're starting to see some of them pull away from proprietary portals, or what they're doing is they're doing a better job implementing encryption on top of them. Okay. So it's, it's the product portal is still there, but it's sent through an encrypted tunnel. Uh -huh. the, the, the challenge that you're faced, especially with IOTM or, or me medical critical infrastructure is a lot of this is rooted in 20, 30 years ago. Right, oh, yeah. and so it's not new design. It's design that's been here for a long time, where security was not the forefront, or we didn't have these concepts of the attacks that we have now, or sophistication. And changing that is a multi-decade problem. No, I, I understand. And, yeah, and it's what you talk about. Like as an example, like people who find vulnerabilities in uh, in the baseband firmware and modems, you know, they're 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 always wondering, well, why why can't they just fix this? And it's like, well, because if they make any changes then they typically, the, 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 the modem providers typically have to go through recertification with the carriers and the medical industry is very similar. You make a change, well, you got to Yeah, it's not just that, but then you have backwards compatibility issues as well. You know, uh, when I was working on some of the medical devices, to, in order to fix the flaw that was discovered, they would have had to replace all of the devices in the hospital. Yes. Well, if you go tell a hospital that they need to go replace all of their infusion <laughs> pumps, that's like you know a $10 million, $25 million endeavor, and that's not necessarily... Yeah, you know, then you have to reasonable. start looking at, okay, is there better ways? Right, or, right. Anyway, so, thank you. Yes. Okay, I think uh, I'm being told we're at time here, so thank you for your time, and uh, happy to take any questions outside.